All right. So now we want to talk about this idea of average value, right? And so we understand, you know, how to do average, you know, for for some finite number of values, right? For finite lists, right? If we have, say, if we have values x1, x2, up to xn, we know how to find the average, right? We learned this in, in high school. The average value is just, well, we add them all up. And we divide by how many items there are on the list, right? Exactly how I would compute, let's say, your average score on a test, right? Add up all the test scores, divide by a number of students who wrote the test, that gives us the average. Okay. But now we're in, a, we're in a much different situation here. We want to calculate the average value for some quantity which is not a discrete quantity like this. It's a continuous, continuously varying quantity, right? So think about, again, maybe velocity, right? You have an object that's moving with varying speed, varying velocity, and you want to calculate the average, right? Say you're driving from Lethbridge to Calgary or you know, between wh wherever you live in some other city, right? You know how long you went, how far you went, you know how long it took you, right? You can calculate the average speed as distance divided by time, right? But maybe you, maybe you actually knew, you know, at every moment in time, what was your velocity? How could you take that knowledge of your velocity at every moment in time and use it to figure out the average? That's what we were looking at here, right? So we know that we can calculate the area under this curve, and it's an integral, right? We know that that area has to be bigger than what we'd get if we took sort of the minimum value for the function on that interval, right? The area is definitely bigger than that. And it's smaller than what we get if we took the, the maximum value for the function over that interval, right? Okay. The true area is somewhere in between. And so now the question is, well, could you find, you know, is there some sort of sweet spot somewhere in between? If I kind of start raising this one up or bringing that one down, is there somewhere in between? Is there some y value? So that if I take that height, I take that y, and I multiply by the width of my rectangle, b minus a, is there going to be some value that is equal to the area under the curve, right? Which is the integral from a to b of fx dx, okay? That's what we're looking for. And ideally, it would be nice if we could express that in terms of, you know, what we're dealing with, right? And so we might say, hey, look, there's, there happens to be this point here, c, where if I plug it into my function, I get that y value. So maybe we write this as f of c minus times b minus a, right? So there is a result which says exactly this, okay? This is a theorem. So the theorem is called the, it's the mean value theorem. And of course, we've already seen a mean value theorem. This is the mean value theorem for integrals. And the mean value theorem for integrals says that as long as f is continuous on AB, well, this C exists. So there is actually a C somewhere between A and B. such that f of c times b minus a is equal to the integral from a to b of f of x dx, okay? So there's a theorem that says exactly that, right? Um, so mean value, right, is, is another way of saying average value. So the next thing we say is, well, what does this have to do with average? How does this tie in? How do we get to this idea of, oh, you know, um, averaging a list of numbers? How are these related? Um, so we want to we wanna talk about that. We'll explain how that works. I think we'll do it in the next video because we're at five minutes now. Um, 
This result here is actually, it's pretty easy to convince yourself that it's true. If you remember the original mean value theorem for derivatives, and if you remember the fundamental theorem of calculus, right? So if we, if we think about the first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus, we define an antiderivative, say big F, you know, as the integral from A to X of Fx dx, right? And you apply the, the old mean value theorem to that. Well, it's going to say that, you know, there exists this C so that if you do big F at B minus big F at A, you're going to get big F prime at C times B minus A. But big F prime is just little f, right? This is big F at B. Big F at A is zero, right? So it is just, it's, it's, it's the same mean value theorem as before. It's just applied to a function that's defined in terms of an integral, okay? But it's useful in this context, so it's worth stating it as a separate theorem.